Hello, I'm Dr. Zygmunt Kozicki, and uh, today we're going to talk about violence and victims. This is part of the series Slippery Slope which is an ongoing look at how when people don't pay attention and do the right thing problems develop and these problems sometimes are more than people ever expected. I want to talk a little bit about violence as an epidemic in America and to begin this program I'd like to take you to the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida, the scene of the worst mass shooting in America where I had an opportunity to pay my respects just recently and it reminded me and it should remind you that violence is an epidemic and there are many victims in this country. Pulse is a nightclub where the worst mass shooting in American history took place. Fifty people were killed and another fifty or more people were injured in this nightclub when one person decided to use violence to deal with conflicts that he was having with people. The shooting took place here when people had come to enjoy the evening to share in a social event, and instead of a celebration, it became a death trap. But it is typical of what violence brings to any community. Sorrow, deep hurt, resentments that never get taken care of, a loss that cannot be taken care of in any way, and a deep stain on a community's potential to grow yet as you sit here and listen to people come and talking, you hear them say things like, maybe one day people will learn to accept each other and get along with one another. And that's the important thing, is that there's some positive that can come from this. But preventing violence, that's gonna take some real effort, some real dedication from public health people. Otherwise, we're gonna see more of these kinds of places in America, and we've already had too many. We need to end the violence in America. We need to prevent the violence in America. And the way we do that is through good public health policy and communities working together. And teaching people that violence is not the way to solve the problem. It only leads to more problems. Violence begets more violence. Violence is an extreme form of aggression, such as assault, rape, or murder. Violence has many causes, including frustration, exposure to violent media, violence in the home or neighborhood, and a tendency to see other people's actions uh, as hostile in some way, even if they're not. Certain situations also will increase uh, the risk of aggression. These include such things as drinking too much, insults from others, uh, or provocations, and environmental factors like the heat uh, and overcrowding. If we look at the world, and, and if we use the Global Peace Index, uh, if you look at this map, you'll see that there are regions in the red. These are regions where there is uh, very little peace, much violence. The regions in gold, and that includes uh, the United States, are regions where there is less violence, but there's still a, a large amount of violent activity going on. If you look at the regions in green, these are regions that are relatively peaceful with very little violence. And you'll notice that Canada, which is our northern neighbor, has very little violence and is a much more peaceful place than we have here in the United States. So what's the economic impact of violence? Well, to begin with, there's a direct cost. The cost of violence to the victim, the perpetrator, and the government. Uh, this includes direct expenditures, such as the cost of policing. There's indirect cost also. These are the accruals uh, after the violent event, and they include uh, indirect economic losses that can take place, physical and physiological trauma to the victim, and lost productivity. And then we can have a multiplier effect. This re represents the flow-on effects of direct costs, such as additional economic benefits that would have come from investing in business development or education instead of containing or dealing with violence.
So Dr. Gary Slutkin, who I consider one of the most eminent uh, experts on epidemiology and violence, uh, has developed an interruption process that deals with violence. And he can better describe some of the things that go into violence. Hi, I'm Gary Slutkin. I'm the founder and CEO of Cure Violence. Cure Violence is a uh, public health organization that works on violence as a contagious problem, even a contagious disease. Um, we're working in about 25 cities in the U.S. and actually also on about five continents where um, this epidemic control method using outreach workers um, helps reduce violence. Um, Cure Violence sees um, violence is primarily a health problem. We're um, seeing the people who are doing violence as people who um, have picked up this contagious process from following each other and from having been traumatized. And we see and have uh, a lot of data now on the ability of interrupters and outreach workers, hospital responders to reduce violence in the same way that health workers in other epidemics reduce uh, violence in other epidemics. Cure violence experience um, in Baltimore and New York and New Orleans and Chicago and, and many other cities has shown that it's actually possible to get the killings to zero. And we, this has been shown in um, up to a year and a half in some um, communities in Baltimore, up to two years in Yonkers. Several communities now have gone a year or more with uh, zero killings by the, the method of having violence interrupters and outreach workers, hospital responders, like a systematic um, ability to detect a potential event and to cool people down and to keep the violence down at this level. What's required to maintain this is enough around the, the clock coverage with the same basic modalities of being able to find a first event, just like you, if you were to find a potential first SARS or bird flu or Ebola event, being able to you know, intercept it early enough. Um, that what um, keeps violence down ultimately however is that the norms have changed in the community especially among your friends and so this is like you know what would keep drunk driving down what would keep cigarette smoking down you know in um, various places as if enough of your friends disapprove of it and so that requires a, um, a maintenance of effort in interruption, although with time less and less of these are required. But it requires also that enough of the um, people have been interacted with to the point at which um, they now are solid and confident enough to tell their own friends, not requiring the interrupter, tell their own friends, you know, you are going to do what? You're thinking of what? You know, we, don't you see we don't do that anymore? That doesn't make sense. Let me help you rethink this. And then it's, so there's these norms that keep the, the new behaviors becoming the usual behavior. Okay. The estimated number of murders in our nation was about 15,696 in 2015. During the year, there were an estimated 90,185 rapes. Firearms were used in 71.5% of our nation's murders, 40.8% of the robberies, and 24.2% of aggravated assaults. So you know what the weapon of choice is. When we look at violence in America, the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, has estimated that there are 1,197,704 violent crimes committed in the United States in 2015, and most of them would be aggravated assaults. And we look at the homicide rate comparing the United States, Canada, Australia, and the UK. 60% of the homicides are committed by guns in the United States. If you look at Canada, that number is much smaller. Australia, even smaller yet. And when you look at the United Kingdom, hardly at all. 
So many people die annually from gunfire in the United States. Uh, there have actually been more people killed by gunfire from 1968 to 2011 than all of the wars fought by this country. 1.4 million firearm deaths in that period of time compared to 1.2 million U.S. deaths in every conflict from the War of Independence to the Iraq War. So experts have looked at gun violence and mass shootings, and you may be interested in, in what they have to say. In Orlando, more tributes to victims, more candles lit in their honor, while in Washington, more votes on gun control legislation. The motion is not agreed to. Senate lawmakers voted down a total of four proposals aimed at keeping suspected extremists from acquiring guns and aimed at mandatory background checks. The debate continues in the House of Representatives. For political reasons, uh, people are not um, doing the, the kinds of things we would normally do if we had airplanes crashing every day. 30,000 people die each year in the U.S. because of gun violence. The Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, keeps track of the numbers, but that's just about all, says Shannon Frateroli via Skype. The CDC does fund uh, research in injury prevention, but none of their funding goes toward gun violence prevention research. Experts say Congress doesn't treat gun violence as the critical public health issue it is. And while mass shootings are widely publicized, their victims represent only a small number of the people who die from gun violence. The majority of gun violence is actually committed um, by people we know. After mass shootings, weapon sales soar, spurred by fears Congress will restrict purchases. The number one reason that we had people coming in yesterday was for personal protection. It turns out that, that the people that are more likely to hurt you with your firearm are either yourself or someone who knows you. Um, the risk that people have around um, um, the intruder coming to you with their gun um, is far less risky than people think it is. Experts say they need more information on just about everything related to gun violence and gun ownership in order to make it safer. One thing they do know is who is most likely to commit murder. One of the best predictors of who is going to commit gun violence is who has been violent in the past. Shannon Frateroli says that includes people who abuse their spouses. Carol Pearson, VOA News, Washington. So if we look at the cost, the economic cost of violence in the United States, it is one trillion. $604,983,000 in in 2016 to cover the economic cost of violence. Per capita cost for all of us, each one of us, is $4,954. In the effect on the gross domestic product, it eats up 8.6% of our economic gross domestic product. And these numbers are in contrast to what we see about the public perception of violence, for instance. It, most people think that crime's on the rise. It's actually on the decrease. If you look at the graph on the left, you'll see that people think that there's more crime now than there has been. But if you look at the, the crime statistics since 1993, it has been falling steadily. And crime rates, if we go left to right here, in all areas are dropping. Violent crime uh, per uh, 100,000 residents, violent crime per 1,000 people ages 12, uh, property crime for, uh, in the United States, and also property victimization. All have been dropping steadily. Let's look at the cost of violence worldwide. The economic impact of violence on the global economy in 2016 was $14.3 trillion in purchasing power parity. This figure is equivalent to 12.6% of the world's economic activity or gross world product. And it means that it equals $1,953 for every person in the world. So let's take a look at gun violence. The Brady 
uh, campaign to prevent gun violence has taken a stand in this issue. Dan Gross is a person who uh, regularly talks about this, and you may find this TED Talk interesting. You don't necessarily have to agree with it, but you may find it interesting. Okay, so confession. I've always been weirdly obsessed with advertising. I remember watching Saturday morning cartoons, paying more attention to the commercials than to the shows, trying to figure out how they were trying to get inside my head. Ultimately, that led me to my dream job. I became a partner at a big New York ad agency, but then all of that suddenly changed on February 23rd, 1997, when my little brother, Matt, was shot in the head in a shooting that happened on the observation deck of the Empire State Building. Suddenly, my family was thrown into the middle of a nightmare, being told that my brother was going to die, actually being given the opportunity to say goodbye to him, then several emergency brain surgeries, and now what's amounted for Matt to a lifetime spent courageously recovering from a traumatic brain injury. He is definitely my hero. But as much as, yeah, he deserves it. <laughs> But as much as this tragedy was a nightmare for my family, I often think about how much worse it could have been. In fact, how much worse it is for the 90 families every day who aren't as fortunate, who lose loved ones, brothers, sisters, sons, daughters, parents. They don't all make national headlines. In fact, most of them don't. They go largely unnoticed in a nation that's kind of come to accept a disgraceful national epidemic as some kind of new normal. So I quit my job in advertising to try and do something about this disgraceful national epidemic because I came to realize that the challenges to preventing gun violence are actually the same ones that made me love advertising, which is to try to figure out how to engage people only instead of doing it to sell products, doing it to save lives. And that comes down to finding common ground where what I want overlaps with what you want. And you might be surprised to learn when it comes to gun violence just how much common ground there is. Let's Let's look, for example, at people who love to hunt, sport enjoyed by millions across the U.S. It's a proud tradition, families. In some places, the first day of hunting season is actually a school holiday. What do hunters want? Well, they want to hunt. They love their guns. They believe deeply in the Second Amendment right to own those guns. But that doesn't mean that there isn't common ground. In fact, there's a lot of it, starting with the basic idea of keeping guns out of dangerous hands. This isn't about taking certain guns away from all people. It's about keeping all guns away from certain people. And it's the people that it turns out we all agree shouldn't have guns, convicted violent criminals, domestic abusers, the dangerous mentally ill. We can all appreciate how Brady background checks have been incredibly effective in keeping guns out of those dangerous hands. In 20 years, Brady background checks at federally licensed firearm dealers have blocked 2.4 million gun sales to those people that we all agree shouldn't have guns. To And whether you love guns or hate guns, you probably also appreciate that there shouldn't be thousands of gun sales every day at gun shows or online without those Brady background checks, just like there shouldn't be two lines to get on an airplane, one with security and one with no security. And And the numbers show the overwhelming agreement among the American public. 90% of Americans support expanding Brady background checks to all gun sales, including 90% of Republicans, more than 80% of gun owners, more than 70% of NRA members. This is not a controversial idea. In fact, only 6% of the American public disagrees. That's about the percentage of the American public that believes that the moon landing was a fake. <laughs> 
And it's also about the percentage that believes that the government is putting mind-controlling technology in our TV broadcast signals. That's the extent to which we agree about background checks. But what about the 300 million guns already out there in homes across America? Well, first, it's important to realize that those guns are mostly in the hands and homes of decent law-abiding people like you and me who want what we all want, including keeping our families safe. In fact, that's why more and more people are choosing to own guns. Ten years ago, 42% of the American public believed that a gun incorrectly makes your home safer. Today, that number is 63%. Why? Well, I kind of hate to say it because it gets the dark underbelly of advertising, which is if you tell a big enough lie enough times, eventually that lie becomes the truth. And that's exactly what's happened here. The corporate gun lobby has spent billions of dollars blocking the CDC from doing research into the public health epidemic of gun violence blocking pediatricians from talking to parents about the dangers of guns in the home, blocking smart gun technology and other technology that would prevent kids from firing parents' guns and would save lives. They're desperate to hide the truth because they view the truth as a threat to their bottom line. And every day people are dying as a result, and a lot of those people are children. Every day in the U.S., nine kids are just shot unintentionally 900 children and teens take their own lives every year. And here's the thing, they're almost all with a parent's gun. Even two-thirds of school shootings happen with a gun taken from the home, including the terrible tragedy at Sandy Hook. I meet so many of these parents, it's the most heartbreaking part of my job. These are not bad people. They're just living with the unimaginable consequences of a very bad decision made based on very bad information that was put into their minds by very bad people who know good and well the misery that they're causing but just don't care. And the result is a nightmare, not only for families like me, but for really, at the end of the day, all of us. But I'm not here to talk about the nightmare of gun violence. I'm here to talk about our dream, and it's a dream we all share, which is the dream of a better, safer future. For my organization, for the Brady Campaign, that dream is reflected in the bold goal to cut the number of gun deaths in the U.S. in half by 2025, and I hope to leave all of you here tonight with a strong sense of exactly why that dream is so absolutely within reach, because folks, for every great movement around the world, there's a moment where you can look back and say, that's when things really started to change. And I'm here to say that for the movement to end gun violence in America, that moment is here. We are so clearly at a tipping point because the American public has come together by the millions like never before based on that common ground to say enough, enough of the mass shootings in malls and movie theaters and churches and schools, enough of the daily terror of gun violence that in homes and streets that's claiming the lives of women and young black men in staggering proportions, enough of easy access to guns by the people that we all agree shouldn't have them and enough of a small group of craven politicians putting Putting the interests of the corporate gun lobby ahead of the people that they have been elected to represent. Enough. And the really exciting thing is it's not just the usual suspects like me that are saying it anymore. It's so much bigger than that. And if you want proof, let's start where most conversations in the U.S. Seems to, seem to start, with Kim Kardashian. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the thing, it's not really a joke. I mean, think about when issues change. It's when they go from being political issues and advocacy issues to being part of pop culture, voices coming from everywhere, celebrities using their platforms, musicians, athletes, the NBA has come forward, conservative pundits that you never would have imagined have come forward. You know, there's real cultural change. I even hear there's a TED talk about it this year. I mean, that's the extent to which this cultural change is, is happening. And yes, Kim Kardashian has made an unsolicited, passionate appeal to her 35 million Twitter followers for expanded background checks. 
Let's look at the political elections that are heating up. You know, this used to be the classic third rail issue for Democrats. Couldn't run from it fast enough. Now candidates are running on it. Some are being forced to reverse very bad positions they defended very comfortably until very recently. You know, for somebody like me, you know, watching people wave around their negative uh, NRA ratings, um, it's almost surreal to watch. We're still outfunded, yes, by the corporate gun lobby, and ultimately that needs to change. But you know what? We're smarter, and we're scrappier, and we have the truth on our side, and we're on offense. You know, they say that the internet democratizes information. Social media and some of the organizing tools that plug into it have democratized activism. It's allowed us to show what 90% support really looks like. Sometimes I think of it, you know, we're converging and attacking instantly by the millions, kind of like white blood cells. You know, it's, it's enabled us to start to really close, and this is the bottom line, close that disgraceful disconnect between what the American public wants and what our elected leaders are doing about it. It. Until recently, the narrative in Congress was that calls from the other side, from that 6%, outnumbered calls from our side, 10 to 1. We're flipping that narrative on its head. After that recent terrible tragedy in San Bernardino, we jammed congressional switchboards. We put 15,000 calls into Congress in 24 hours. And you know what? We got a vote on a bill that nobody thought was going to see the light of day anytime soon. We're seeing real movement to repeal some of the most evil ugly gun lobby legislation passed over the last dark decade. The stranglehold of the gun lobby is clearly being broken. We've seen President Obama's historic executive actions. They don't go all the way, but they are going to save lives because they expand Brady background checks to thousands of gun sales that didn't have them previously. And we are marching across the country. We're not just waiting for Congress to act. That would almost be the definition of insanity. We're marching across the country, state by state, marriage equality style. And you know what? We're winning. Congress is almost always the last to wake up and realize that it's on the wrong side of history. And when they do, it's always because the American public shakes them. And that's exactly what we're doing right now as we're in this tipping point. You know, recently I was flying cross country to give a speech to a large group like this, although far less intimidating. And the woman sitting next to me happened to be binge watching one of my all time favorite TV shows. Mad Men, a uh, period TV show about advertising in the 1960s. And as I was trying to think about how to end my remarks, I'd glance up at her screen every now and then. And it seemed that every time I did, I'd see somebody smoking in an office, or around children, or while pregnant, or drinking and driving, or driving without seatbelts, or sexually harassing a coworker. And ultimately, it dawned on me what tremendous inspiration for those of us who have this dream to end gun violence. I mean, think about how much the world has changed in a relatively short period of time, how all those behaviors that were once considered commonplace or normal, some even glamorous or sexy, have become stigmatized in just a generation or two once they became conversations about our common ground. That is the magnitude of the change we have the potential to create around gun violence. And that's my dream, that maybe someday some period TV show will depict the terrible nightmare of gun violence, and a future generation of children might only be able to imagine how terrible it must have been. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank everybody for taking the time to think about violence and victims. And really, the emphasis ought to be on victims. We ought to be doing everything possible to have less victims uh, of violence in this country. And that's something that you and I can do together.
uh, MI Legalize, the Michigan Comprehensive Cannabis Law Reform Initiative Committee proposal will allow any city, township, village, or federally recognized tribe to ban or to allow any size cultivation, processing, or uh, retail operations of adult use of marijuana. In addition, it would allow any adult to grow up to 12 plants, and most importantly, it removes all the criminality except for transferring to minors and driving under the influence where um, right now even a medical patient can grow 12 plants, but that 13th plant is a felony. Under MI Legalize, a 13th plant would not be a felony, it would not be a misdemeanor, it would be a civil infraction, punishable only by a fine. And so we think it's important to take marijuana, cannabis, um, out of the criminal justice system. It's a public health issue. It should not be treated as a criminal justice issue. And so um, it breeds distrust between the police and the citizenry. Stop the